Second Chronicles 35, Second Chronicles 35, 20 to 24. Are we there? If you're there, say amen. amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. After all this, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Kache. Kakemish, by the Euphrates River. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I have not come against you this day, but against the house with which I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, refrain from meddling with God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised <coughs> sorry, himself so that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God. So he came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am severely wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. They brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned, and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. In Jesus' name we read, amen. Let me invite you to have your seats. <clears throat> the story of Josiah is, 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 is a good story. And many of us know Josiah as a righteous and a God-fearing king of Israel. And I'd like to begin his story with his great-grandfather, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly man. And Hezekiah is known because when Hezekiah was dying, he was in bed and dying. God sent Isaiah and told Isaiah, go and tell Hezekiah, because he had been praying, just like anyone who's sick. If you've ever been sick or you've had a sick relative, you pray for them. And so Hezekiah prayed earnestly to God. And God sent an answer physically with Isaiah. So Isaiah shows up. And tells Hezekiah, the Lord has told me that you will not survive this disease. It will kill you. No one wants an answer like that, do we? <laughs> no one wants an answer like that. So that's the answer that Hezekiah got from God through Isaiah, the prophet. Immediately, immediately, immediately. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and reminded God three things. Remember, I have served you faithfully. I have served you with wholehearted devotion. And I have done what is right in your eyes. And the Bible says he wept bitterly because he felt betrayed by God. And so he reminded God that he has been faithful. That he had walked with wholehearted devotion and he has done what was right in the eyes of God. The Bible records that before Isaiah had left the palace, the answer had come. So Isaiah quickly ran back into the inner courts and told the king, the Lord has said you will live another 15 years. Now in that 15 years, he got another son called Manasseh. Tell your neighbor Manasseh. Now Manasseh, <laughs> this is what the Bible says about him. Verse, let's start from verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 33. The Bible says this, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abomination of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. As in, he was more evil than the heathen nations. That is Manasseh. Scripture continues. 
He be, for he built the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He raised up altars for the Baals and made wooden images. He worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, he provoked him to anger. He even set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. He brought an idol into the temple of God. As in this guy was cold. He had gone all south. There was nothing left for him to do that he hadn't done. Human sacrifice, the works. Manasseh was an evil king. God dealt with him severely. He was helped captive. They put chains and rings in his nose and pulled him like a cow or a mad dog. He was in such distress that he gave his, he repented and turned his heart around and served God in the last days of his life. And then he died. Then he, but before he died, he had a son called Ammon. Ammon was like his father, Manasseh. He did evil in the sight of God just like his father. Unfortunately, he didn't repent. Ammon didn't repent. He died in his sin because he was assassinated by people in his camp, in, his, in the palace. So Ammon died. He left an 80-year-old son. So Josiah took the reins when he was eight. The Bible says in Second Chronicles 34, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. When his father died, Ammon, an evil king, Josiah was born. Now Josiah was like his great grandfather, Hezekiah. He was a god he became a God-fearing man. He honored God. In fact, the Bible says that he turned the entire nation back to God. He removed all the high places, cut down their share poles, destroyed all idol worship, and killed all the prophets of Baal. He restored the worship of Jehovah. He was a good, righteous man. Praise the Lord for King Josiah. Josiah did amazing things. In verse 18 of chapter 35, Let's start in verse 17. The Bible says this. And the children of Israel who were present kept the Passover at the time and the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. Then, I mean, there had been a Passover kept. There had been no Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. And none of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as Josiah kept. With the priests and the Levites, 
all Judah and Israel were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In the 18 years of the reign of Josiah, this Passover was kept. No one had kept a Passover. No one had sacrificed like Josiah. If you read a few, several verses before that, you see the thousands of animals that Josiah donated for the sacrifice of the Lord, to sacrifice before the Lord. This man had the fear of God and the love of God in his heart. Scripture is telling us that there, has never, there, were, there had never been before a man who had kept the Passover like Josiah. Since the days of Samuel, the prophet, which means before there were kings in Israel. But then comes verse 20. But then, <coughs> verse 20, sorry. But then, verse 20. And it starts by saying, after all this, after he had sacrificed, after he has mobilized the entire nation to worshiping God, after he has done great and mighty things, after he has repented, after he has turned the wrath of God, he has, God's wrath has been turned away from the nation. This man, after all this, verse 20, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Neko, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Kakemish by the Euphrates River. And Josiah went against him. Now, <clears throat> when you live a righteous life, one of the benefits is that God gives you peace, even with your enemies. Hallelujah. God gives you, even with your enemies. You live at peace even with your enemies, because your heart is right with God. So, there is no record of Josiah ever going to war, because God gave him peace. As a king, and in those, in those days, most kings were warriors. There was no reason for Josiah to un, 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 unsk no, not unscathe, unsheath his sword, because it was a side time of, of peace. So God is amazing. Our God is amazing. Watch any mungu to a mungu. So there's an enemy of, to the north, Kakemish. And God wants to deal with Kakemish. So God raises the king of Egypt, Pharaoh from Egypt. His name is Neko. And God, the God of Josiah, speaks to Neko a heathen king, and he tells Neko, go and deal squarely with Kakemish. So as he's marching, he's mobilized one of the greatest armies on earth. Pharaoh, Echo, he's on his way to Kakemish. Josiah hears, he has scouts. So he's told, that the king of Egypt is marching towards this direction. So what does Josiah do? He mobilizes his army quickly, and they march against Neko. Now, Neko has scouts. They come running to him, and they say, the king of Judah is marching against us. Neko immediately sends messengers to Josiah, tells Josiah, I have no beef with you. I have no quarrel with you, king of Judah. I have been sent by God to deal with Kakemish, and I must do it with haste. I must do it quickly. I don't know if there are parents in this house, in the house of the Lord this, this afternoon. Have you ever sent a child for water? And then they take forever. Or you are cooking. You are 
you are cooking. And you call them because you don't want to leave. You're starting something and you want somebody to pass you something quickly. And you call them, come, come and pass me this, this spatula or this spice quickly. And you're there assuming that they ran and they are there. And when you lift their eyes, you're like, what do you mean? You, you, you don't even know what I told you. Now, Neko wasn't like that. When Pharaoh, Neko Pharaoh was told by God to come and to come quickly. The Bible says he came in haste. And he warned Josiah. He said, Josiah, king of Judah, me I have no beef with you. Do not meddle with the instructions given to me by God. Because if you do, you will get hurt. But Josiah was with God. He had been talking to God. He had just sacrificed to God. How can you, what do you mean God has sent you? First of all, you are Pharaoh. You worship idols. What is this you're telling me at my God? I'm equal. How? So Josiah decides to disguise himself and remain in the battlefield. Neko is committed to the instructions given by God. So he's not going to be stopped by the king of Judah just because he's, a, he's serving God. No. So his archers are the forerunners. Even before Neko gets there, the archers shoot the king of Judah. And Josiah is fatally wounded. They rush him to Jerusalem and he bleeds out and dies. And Josiah doesn't die honorably. He dies from the arrow of the enemy. Josiah missed God. You live a righteous life all your life. You live serving God all your life. And towards the end, you miss God. Friends, let me tell you something. The devil is not your age mate. He's been in at this for years. And he has a plan. And the enemy is patient. Just after serving... Yeah? He has just offered a sacrifice that has never been there before. And here he is. Just after that sacrifice, he has missed God. He missed God. I have a question for you this afternoon. Whatever your situation this morning, because all of us have a prayer need, what is God saying about that which you're praying about? What do you think God is saying about your current situation? If our decisions are not led of the Holy Spirit, you will, make, you will turn a corner and it will destroy everything you have built. Because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The sad part for me is this. Many of us miss God because the place of prayer is no longer existent. As a church, every second Saturday we meet here for prayer and fasting. Not just crying out to God to meet our need, but to also connect with him and to sharpen our spiritual ears that we may hear his voice. When was the last time in your house you had prayer? Personal prayer, personal devotion. When was the last time you woke up half an hour earlier to just spend time in the presence of God, to read his word because he has revealed himself through the word, and to commit your heart to God and your day before you start? How many of us... In the evening, you decide, you know what, after everyone has gone to sleep, I'm going to spend another hour to just be in the presence of God. Neko was a righteous man. He had done great and mighty things. 
But at the end, he missed God. Neko missed God. Eh? Oh, sorry. Oh. Josiah. Josiah missed God. Because he couldn't bring himself to imagine that Neko, Pharaoh Neko, a heathen king who worships idols, would hear the voice of God. We missed him. There's another king a few years before Josiah. As a young man, his name is David. David is not king yet. He's actually in exile. He's running from Saul. He's living in caves. But at this point, he has an army of riffraffs. And they number 600 men. And they have become mercenaries. They are an army for hire. And now they are willing to fight for the Philistines. And when they get to the battlefield, the Philistines get scared. They're like, no. If we are fighting the Israelites, David might turn on us from the back and kill us. Now at this point, the Philistine king had given <coughs> the city of Ziklag to David and his 600 men. So that's where they build their houses and raise their cattle. And they flourished there. So when they were rejected by the king of the Philistines, the elders of the Philistines, the generals, they said, no, we can't go to war with this man on our side. He might turn on us. Send him away. So David was sent away with the 600 men. When they got to Ziklag, when they got to Ziklag, they found that Ziklag had been burnt down three days before. They were just smoldering ashes left. They have nothing, even a change of clothes. Because when you go to the battlefield, you don't bury a rucksack and a change of clothes. They have come home from the battlefield. They don't even have a change of clothes. Their children are all taken. Their wives have been kidnapped as slaves now. And they have no idea whether they went north, south, East or west, because it's three days ago. They felt defeated. They have bows and arrows and spears. But in this case, they were useless because they had no idea where the enemy went. The Bible says they got there in the morning. The Bible says they cried from morning to evening. They wept until they had no more strength. That's what the Bible says. They didn't eat, they didn't drink, they just cried. <clears throat> In the evening, out of frustration, they said, let us kill David. Let's stone him. He's the one who said we go. And we left Ziklag exposed. So hell, all hell has broken loose. So it's at that point. It's at that point. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Lesson number one. When the center doesn't hold, encourage yourself in the Lord. Number two. He asked Abiathar for the prayer shawl, the effort. He didn't ask Abiathar the priest to pray. He didn't send him a prayer request. This one, in Yakujiombea. It's Yakupelekea pastor. In Yamimi Najipelekea Kwamungu. 
Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. When the mud hits the fan, there are times you don't send a prayer request, you go yourself. So he encouraged himself with the Lord, and then now he said, Abiatha, bring me the effort. Bring me the effort. Now, the effort wasn't his. The effort is a priest, is what the priest uses. So he's borrowing the priest's effort. He covered his head with it. Whether he went on his knees or he sat, I don't know. All I know is this. He prayed two prayers. Two short prayers. He asked God, should I pursue? Number two, will I overtake them? God answers both. He says, yes, go. You shall overtake them. So whether they went at night or not, I have no idea. But this I know. Immediately, in the morning or at that point in the evening, they set out. Now, they haven't eaten. They haven't drunk. They've come from the battlefield. And now they are going into another battle. 200 of them were too tired to proceed. Actually, they went, but halfway through they said, I love my wife and my kids, but I'm too tired. Me, I'm staying here. <laughs> Say 200 divorce cases loading. So 200 men were too exhausted to proceed. And David said, it's okay, you wait here. Relax and recuperate. But 400 said, we are going on. Now, on whose instruction are they proceeding? God. God has answered a prayer. And he has said, yes, go. Number two, you shall over. Take them. So they are going. And I'm sure at this point, they are not just walking slowly. When, <clears throat> I don't, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever sent money on M-Pesa and you sent the wrong number? Anyone by show of hand? Anyone? Mm. Star, four, five, six, hash. Now, haste, or you have to do it quickly. Eh? To be quick is of essence, true? Because how fast you are able to type that message will determine the difference of whether you will recover the money or, or not. How fast you can type star 456 hash send that message quickly will determine how soon or the possibility of you getting your money back. So that's what. So now that God has told David, proceed, you will overtake. In that statement, the fact that you will overtake, it means that you take your best horses and you ride as fast as possible. Because if you're going to overtake, it means that you must move faster than them. In Jesus' name. So David stands up and he's pursuing these guys with the little strength he has left. They are pursuing on donkeys, on camels, on horses, on foot. They are going 400 men and one and David. We have to get everything back. God has told us we will recover. We will lose nothing. And then, in, a, in some field on the way, they find an Egyptian slave lying down on the field somewhere. Now, it's at this point I want to tell you this. <coughs> have you ever read the Bible and you've asked yourself, what would I have done if I was there? If I was the one who was David, I would not have recovered my wife and children. Not because I don't love them. Not because I'm part of the 200. But because I would have missed God at that point. So David, 400 men pursuing for themselves to recover everything, including a change of clothes. They don't even have a glass they can have water because the Amalekites carried everything and burnt their homes. So every man here is fighting for himself, not for David. The anger, 
the drive is palpable. And then David finds a slave, hungry and sickly, on a field out there. And he stops the entire army. And speed is of essence to minister to this guy. These guys are riding like mad. They are riding like Jehu. Like madmen to recover their wife and their children. If you take my wife and my children, I am telling you with my last breath, I will find you. I will come with everything. Kiatwiki talk, I'm not going back for it. I'm coming. I am coming. Then David, in the middle of that field, he shouts to the army, Hey, stop, 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 stop. And the army is like, Nini, Nini, Tena. <coughs> You've just told us God has said we'll overtake. Let's go quickly. And David says, No, 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 stop, stop, stop. Army, Jesh, is my man, is my man. This one is not for praying. This one is for let's go. Let us go. God, you are, you are the one who has told us God has said we shall overtake them. And you are saying, stop, stop. And they are there. Why are we stopping? Why are we stopping? So they ask each other, Why are we stopping? 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 Abiatha, why are we stopping? So we already prayed, why are we stopping? Why are we stopping? David says, Hey, hey. So David finds this guy. He's a slave. He hasn't eaten for three days. And he's sick, he's dying. David, David sits on the ground and he asks him, What's your name? Where are you from? And I'm sure the soldiers are wondering. We can do this UN business later. We can be Red Cross after. We recover our, our wives and our children. I don't even have a change of clothes. I need to find these guys. I love one atakujapa kufanya kazi ya Red Cross. Seriously? So David is not listening to these haters. And there are many. David is listening to this young man. He asked them, who are you and where are you from? And the guy says, I am an Egyptian and I am a slave. My master left me here when I fell sick three days ago. I have not eaten. I have not drunk anything for three days. We had just left Ziklag. We had tucked Ziklag and we burnt it down and we carried everything, including their women and their children. And we have great plunder from other towns and cities that we have plundered. So right there and then, David's questions were answered. Who had attacked them? They know now is the Amalekites. How? When? Three days ago. And the most important question, where are they? And the slave says, promise you will not kill me and I will tell you. And David says, I will do better than promise. I will feed you first. Holds his head and gives him raisin cakes and gives him water to drink. And when he revives, he calls for a horse and he puts the servant, the slave on a horse and he says, show us the way. And the slave knew exactly where these riffraffs were. Yes. 
And he took David right to where they are. And the Bible says he found them celebrating because they had great plunder. And they had sprawled all over the field. And they were drinking and making merry because they had conquered the nations. And they had more than they thought there would ever be. Every man on that field was a wealthy man. They attacked them. The Bible says, except 400 young men who rode off on camels, everybody else was slaughtered on that field. The Bible records that they recovered everything. Spoon, cup, vest, and sandals. Everyone recovered everything that was taken. Only yes. Yes. I will restore that statement is true. Now, what breaks my heart is that if I were David, I would have left that guy. And half of us in this sanctuary today would have left that guy. The fulfillment of, God, of David's prayer was entirely and absolutely pegged on his capacity to extend kindness to a slave who was dying on a field in the middle of nowhere. Amen. This man had been in that field, sickly, hungry, and thirsty for three days. He had slept in the cold for three days. He had nothing to cover himself because he was a slave. They left him nothing. Because a slave is worth nothing but death. They left him. Because in their eyes, a slave and a dead dog are of the same value. David stopped an entire army that needed to get to where they were going in haste, quickly. He stopped them. Bend his knee to minister to an Egyptian slave who was alone and dying on a field. I know without contradiction that I would not have stopped. And half of us in this room would not have stopped either. Yet, his entire prayer, the fulfillment of God's promise was pegged on David's capacity to extend kindness to a dead dog on a lonely field. And it's that good, that nobody before he fed him, just because he asked him, who are you? A few of the critical questions were asked, were answered. One, I am I'm an Egyptian, and I am a slave, and my master is an Amalekite, and we attacked Ziklag three days ago and we carried everything and burnt it down and carried their women and their children. We left nothing. So David knew these guys are three days away. They are Malachites and they have everything that is ours. 
And then the fourth and the final question is, can you show us where he is, where they are? And he says, yes, if you promise not to kill me. Never look down on anyone. Never look down on anyone. That watchman can save your life. That watchman can save your life. That nobody you think is not worth your time might be the answer to your prayer. There was no reason why David would have stopped considering haste was of essence because he has to overtake. I have thought through my head, turned it upside down and asked myself, why did David stop? Why? Because yesterday he called Abiathar. He covered his head and he sought the Lord. So the Holy Spirit was guiding David because it doesn't make sense why he stopped. Unless the Holy Spirit got hold of him and told him to stop. Those things that you do that don't make sense. You can't understand why you did it. You just can't understand because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't. The Holy Spirit didn't tell him anything. At that point, it is not recorded that God spoke to him or an angel of the Lord showed up. Nothing. There's nothing like that. Why did David stop? Why did he stop? Why did David stop an entire army of 400 men? Why? To save. He wasn't going to ask him this man. He had no idea that this man had the answers to his prayer. He had no idea. He stopped to save a man. He stopped to find out why is this man lying down here in a field in the middle of nowhere? Let me check if he has a pulse. Let me check if he's dead. It's out of the kindness of his heart. And out of his kindness, in his ability to show kindness to a nobody, God answered every prayer he had prayed. Wapendwa, usiwai tharao mtu. Never let your children disrespect your house girl. Because tomorrow, the house girl's son might be the president. The house girl's son might be the head of state. And he will send your sons and your daughters and ambassadors to represent the country. I love my wife. And I love my kids to bits. But as I put myself in this, in this story, I would have lost them. Never to see them again. My sons would have become slaves in the Amalekite country because there's no way. There's no way on earth. There's no way on earth. 
I would have stopped to help that guy. My love for my family would not have allowed me to stop. How many things have I missed? Psalms 46 10 says, Be still and know that He is God. How many people in my haste? I have found them changing tires, and I passed. How many people have I found on the road who's broken down, their car is broken down, and I didn't stop? What if they are the answer to my prayer? Kindness. Kindness. His ability to extend grace and mercy to someone who no one cared about. He was a slave whose life was of no value. This is my question. For those three days that that slave was lying there, every man when you come to the end, you turn to God. What if that, that slave would look into the sky for the three nights and ask, God, are you there? And do you care? And can you hear the prayer of a slave like me? I don't know who you are. I've never met you. But if you exist, you who created the stars and the moon, save me. He's so weak. When you haven't eaten or drunk for three days and you're sick, he literally had no strength. When he had the footsteps of an army coming, the natural tendency is to hide and run because they will kill you. He was so weak that he couldn't run. So they found him smack in the middle of the road. And God that day didn't just save his life. He was no longer a slave and he became part of the army. That day, he earned his freedom and he became part of the army and he had a direct line to the king. He wasn't just another soldier. He's a guy who guided the king to everything he had lost. He ate at the king's table. They went home. He went back to Ziklag. Not as a slave, but he had an equal share of the great plunder of the army of David, the soon to be the king of Israel. He had a share. Because when they went back, there were 602. 600 soldiers, David, Abiathar, actually 603, and the Egyptian slave. He will do more than you could ever think, dream, or imagine. That morning, when that slave so the light of day, he didn't know that that night he would have planned than his boss. He would no longer be a slave and he'd have access to the greatest king of Israel. That's our God. That 
is our God. His name is Jehovah. So this afternoon, my prayer is that God touch my heart that I will never despise anyone. That I will never look down on anyone. That there will be humility in my heart because Josiah died out of pride. A great man of God. He died of pride when he refused to move out of the way because he couldn't imagine that Pharaoh Necho would have heard from Jehovah. If only he had prayed to ask God, is this man your servant? God would have said, yes, let him go. But he disguised himself and went into the battlefield and unfished his sword. He shed no blood except his. And that day, he died. Josiah missed God. And David recovered everything. Everything. Because he showed kindness to a nobody. May the Lord have mercy on us. May the Lord have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. I want to conclude in prayer. And I want to ask today if there is anyone here who has a need. You want to present your need to God. You don't need to tell me what it is because God knows that need. Just come to the altar and present it to your Father in heaven. And he is God. The God who was with David. Just come and kneel here. Because he is here and he is able. In Jesus' name. He's able more than able to accomplish what concerns me today. He's able more than able to do much more than I could ever dream he's able more than able to handle every as me today father in the name of jesus christ we are gathered here on this altar knowing that we are before our God and our Father who art in heaven. Jehovah, we know that you are able. You are able to do that which concerns us. You are able to reverse the impossible. You are able to open doors that we didn't even know existed. You are God alone, and there is no other like you. Have mercy on us. Jehovah, in the name of Jesus Christ, I know that you still love each one of us. I pray that on this altar, we shall enjoy the warmth of your embrace, knowing that our Father is here, and our Father has had and our Father will answer. Our hope, Lord, is in you, and we know that hope in you does not disappoint. Father, forgive us where we've sinned against thee, and help us, Almighty God, where we have not believed. Where we have doubted, forgive us, 
And Lord, this afternoon we know that our God is here. And our God can. And our God will. Because our God has. Oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. You are our shield. Rampant. Oh God, our Father. Even before we speak, you know. You know exactly the need. You know it. You know it by name. And every knee, every name will bow. Because there's only one name on heaven and earth. And that name is Christ Jesus. So Lord, I commit every need here this afternoon to you. Knowing, Almighty God, that it has been met by faith because we have brought it before our Father. So, Lord, I dedicate that petition to you. I lift it to thee, Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, do we believe and trust. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering of faith. <laughs> Father, we thank you because we know by faith you have had in Jesus' name. Let me, let me ask at this point if the late Diana Ochola's family is here. Are they here? They are now Chola's family. I had asked if they would come in this service today that we will pray with them. Are they here? Okay. If they are here, let me invite them to come to the front. Can't see. Okay. So we'll hope they'll be here next Sunday. That was the desire of their mother. In Jesus' name. Let me start, let me conclude by saying thank you. Thank you very much for giving. Thank you for giving. I know we are halfway through a building project, planting a church in Sori, but you still gave that the mission committee went to Mokorene, and we had 10 patients who needed a cataract operation that they couldn't afford, and you paid for it. The doctors gave of themselves, the surgeries were done. And I remember there's a short old man in his late 70s came and he said, I can see, I can see, I can see again. So they operated on one eye and the following day they operated, two days later they operated on the other eye and now he can see. And just looking at him, <laughs> looking at that old man, that he can see again because you gave. I want to say as your pastor, I am, I am proud to be your pastor. Thank you for making a difference. Thank you, Pastor Mbutu and your team. Thank you. I know they will be giving us a report as they put it together, how many people were treated, how many eyes, were, how many surgeries were done. And it was a blessing to be there with them, to just see and experience. I also want to say thank you to all of you parents for sending your children to the children's camp. And I want to tell you without fear of contradiction, for us to save this generation, it will be both hands on deck. I'm telling you the truth because the devil has a plan for our children. And it will take all of us to fight for our children. Thank you for those of you who brought the children to the camp. And I know times are tight. And I talk to the children's church workers. And maybe next year, if we have to camp in this building here, then that's where we'll be to bring the cost down so that every child will come. Because out there, 
The enemy has a plan. But not our children in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for trusting us with your children. I was there with them on Thursday. And the camp was fun. Had tea with them, had lunch. Did a craft together with them. And then came back and went to the camp, the mission field. Spent the day and the night with them. And I saw what the Lord is doing. Friends, God has a plan. God has a plan in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord clap offering as we stand. So thank you for coming to church today. As you live today, may the Lord shine his face upon each one of you. May his favor be evident over your life. May none of your bones ever be broken. May what is yours that the devil has taken or touched, may our God in heaven pay you back a hundredfold. May the peace of God that surpasses human understanding, may that peace keep your hearts. May the joy of the Lord fill and saturate every inch of your home. May the joy of the Lord be your portion. Remember you have the power of life and death on your tongue. Exercise that authority by declaring life over the issues that surround your life, over the nation of Kenya, the nation of Israel, and as the Lord may lead you, and on any road you travel on, declare on this road today, no one will lose their life or have their property destroyed. Everyone will get home. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Go with God in Jesus' name.